Back in 2009, something came out that terrified neuroimagers everywhere. Can you guess what it was? If you said leprechaun in the hood, you're wrong. That came out in 2000. The correct answer is a paper called Puzzlingly High Correlations in FMRI Studies, better known as the Voodoo Correlations paper. The paper said that some imaging studies reported inflated correlations because of something called non-independence or circular analysis. So what is circular analysis? Do you ever wonder why we see contradictory advice in the media about what to eat, what to drink, how often to sex each other, and so on? It's partly because of statistical errors, such as forming a hypothesis after the results are known, or not correcting for multiple comparisons. Another fallacy that you don't usually hear about is something called circular analysis in which data are selected based on some criteria and then tested for significance on that same criteria. Let's take a look at why this is a problem and what you can do to avoid it. For example, imagine that we wanted to test whether drinking four loco helps undergraduates do better on their exams. Let's say that we observed which students showed an improvement and then ran our final group level analysis only on those students. Obviously, this would be a biased analysis, since we're only focusing on those subjects that have the effect that we're looking for. It's no longer a truly random sample. Circular analyses can also happen with imaging data, although it's not as apparent when it happens. This was first pointed out in a study which examined activity in the fusiform face area in response to different stimuli. They extracted data from each condition's significant voxels and discovered a pattern of selective activity. However, it was pointed out that if you chose an ROI outside of the brain, which happened to contain significant voxels just by chance, and ran the same tests on those voxels, you would get the same pattern, which clearly shouldn't happen. When they reran the analysis using independent ROIs, they found a pattern of noise which you would expect with a non-brain ROI. When they ran an unbiased ROI analysis on the original data, they found that the original pattern disappeared. Now let's see exactly how biased ROIs lead to inflated effect sizes. Here is a z-score map indicating our group level effects. If we zoom in, we can see the boundaries of each individual voxel with the range of z-scores from zero to three. Assume that there is a real effect in the brain outlined in orange. If we extracted the parameter estimates for each subject from those voxels, the effect would be 0.3, with some variation around that value. Now assume that we threshold our image at an uncorrected level of p less than 0.05 or a z-score of 1.65. The voxels highlighted in red are the only ones that pass that threshold. Here's the important part. Notice that this region overlaps with some of the true effect voxels, but that it includes some noise voxels as well. Because the region by definition can only include voxels passing a certain threshold, it will only contain noise voxels that are above that threshold, which biases the effect to be larger than the true effect. If we used an independent ROI, for example with cross-validation, we would create a region that probably contains some true effect voxels and also some noise voxels. But these noise voxels will not be biased to be artificially high or low. In this example, the unbiased effect is slightly lower than the true effect. But in theory, it could be higher or lower. It just won't be biased either way. In 2009, the Voodoo Correlations paper claimed that many studies were using biased analyses which led to inflated correlations, and also claimed that if they used unbiased analyses, the distribution of effects would be lower. In response, other researchers came out with a movie of their own, Leprechaun Back to the Hood. When it bombed at the box office, however, they decided to write a rebuttal instead. They argued that if you correct for multiple comparisons, the effect does indeed exist. 
Also, if you're doing an exploratory analysis to see where an effect is located, what's the harm in looking within the significant voxels to see what's driving the effect? Isn't it good to know what's going on? The authors of the original paper claimed that there are two problems with those arguments. First, the magnitude of the effect is just as important as detecting whether the effect is there, and bias analyses will systematically overestimate it. Why? Because small studies, by definition, can only detect large effects. The second is that if you publish a bias analysis, the reader may assume that it is an inferential analysis, even if it includes caveats about how it was done. If you absolutely insist on presenting them in a figure, at least don't include error bars. We've only touched on a couple of different ways to do bias analysis, but there are other ways too, and you need to be on the lookout for them. Let's say that you use an anterior cingulate cortex ROI for your confirmatory analysis meaning that you selected the ROI beforehand regardless of what the whole brain results look like. But the results don't pass correction. You then look at the whole brain map and see this. You then decide to use an ROI located more in the pre-SMA. This is also a bias analysis because now you know where your effect is before you decide where to extract from. Wow. We've learned a lot today about imaging, statistics, and cinematic history. In summary, we can't read your mind about what you intended to do with your analysis, but I'm sure that now that you know the difference between biased and unbiased analysis, you'll choose to do the right thing, even if that means your paper will get rejected. Check out the more info box down below for resources on how to do unbiased analyses and papers explaining the topic more in depth. Now try out some of these exercises to reinforce what we've learned today and to make you more aware of when bias analyses can happen. Keep doing it. Let go. Let go. Yeah. Yeah. You like that, huh? That's good shit.